Hello, book lovers, and welcome to Book Talk Radio Club. My name is Claire Harris, and today I'm talking to author Roy Taylor. His novel, African Sunsets, a secular story, is a love story and an adventure like no other. In a time when Africa was a primitive, unsettled wilderness, where early settlers lived an extraordinary existence, it was a life of survival and challenge. Hello, Roy. Thanks for coming back to talk to me on Book Talk Radio Club. Pleasure. Nice to talk with you, Claire. Welcome and happy to be back. Thank you. Can you give Book Talk Radio Club's listeners a brief synopsis of the story, please? Yes, it's a story about a um, young couple who meet in Scotland and um, the, 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 the gentleman, uh, Malcolm, has a dream. Uh, he's training in Edinburgh and to become a brewer and um a master brewer and he he has a goal to go to africa and um and start a brewery out there and so liz becomes uh, involved with him and she decides that she wants to take the challenge with him and they emigrate to kenya in east africa and uh they start a life out there and uh face all the challenges that to some degree they probably never an- anticipated but um but they lived a, a very successful life out there, and uh, it became a, um, a, a a wonderful story. So here we have the two main characters, Malcolm Walker and Liz. What kind of people are they? You've got to be a certain type of person to want to actually emigrate to somewhere that's very, very primitive from Scotland or from, as it were, civilization. That sounds bad, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I to- totally agree with you. Um, this is a this is a challenge like no other because um in the days that these two emigrated there it was a very primitive area it was occupied by the british um primarily the military uh, had taken it over and there were some some very early settlers already there but um they kind of carved a path for themselves and um and uh, it became very obvious in the book that it was tough times, but um, rewarding in the sense that they were achieving their goals and learned very quickly to, I guess they had to be tough people because to be, yeah. to be resilient and deal with what they dealt with would be something most people would um, fail at, I'm sure. The story takes Malcolm and Liz through their journey to their new homeland. And as the saga takes on new horizons, they face unbelievable challenges in the harsh, the beautiful environment of Kenya. So can you just give us an, an idea um, in depth? What kind of challenges do they face? Maybe just give us a couple of ideas. Well, you have to imagine that, um, you know, when, when, when they went there, there was um, virtually no habitation around them where they lived. Um, mm. It was bush. And the bush was um, home to many, many wild animals and uh, creatures of all descriptions. And it was also a a place where primitive African um, inhabitants lived. So they faced the the challenges that went with dealing with both. And um, in those days, it was tough because... um, Law and order was a long way away, and you had to, to some degree, um, defend and and protect yourself. And that was really the toughest part of the challenge. Dealing with the wildlife was another problem altogether. So what um, kind of wildlife are we talking about here? From from my uh, memory, I've got to say this. um, Every kind of wild animal you can imagine, hyenas, lions, elephants and a whole host of different uh, venomous snakes was part of their life and um, even as I grew up there in the early years I, I, I remember the, we used to deal with a snake almost every single day of my life and none of them were friendly I can assure you. <laughs> it's, it's funny isn't it how you can re- people romanticize the idea of living amongst lions and elephants and seeing wildlife but actually when you get down to the reality it's bloody scary. It's a very scary thought. You know, I, I since have left there, obviously, but um, I many times sit and think, I think, good Lord, we grew up there and I love the memories and it's been a wonderful experience of my life. But, oh, I, I don't know whether I've got the uh, spirit to be able to handle that kind of life again, but um, it, it is tough. And um, 
But I think you said a mindset. It's like anything. If you've got a if you've got a need to do something, um, the mindset builds with it, and you yes. take on the challenge and you survive. And uh, yeah. I think that's exactly what they did. On your website, africansunsets.org, you have the first chapter titled "The Meeting" for people to read. Would you like to give us an idea about the meeting, where it takes place in the background? Yes. Um, keep in mind that. When I wrote this book, I, I wrote the book to um, as a novel, but it, a, almost the entire book was based on true stories from my youth. And, uh, and, uh, and I included my grandparents, who were the first settlers. Uh, they, right. weren't quite, they weren't quite Malcolm and Liz, but um, my mm-hmm. grandfather came from Lancashire, and so did Liz. And, um, and basically, they met in Scotland, and I, I kind of described one of the most beautiful hotel scenes in Scotland. Um, mm. I shall leave it nameless for, for obvious yeah. reasons, but it was yeah. an absolutely magnificent place. And um, they, they, they became, um, uh, they met at this wonderful place where they were taking a break from their college life. Uh, uh, working holidays and so um, it was an opportunity where they they became uh, entwined and um, and it, it was a perfect place to start the relationship and I used that as the as the opportunity to take them from the UK to um, to Kenya. Mm-hmm. Let's find out a little bit about you now Roy Taylor. You were born in Edinburgh, Scotland at four months old, you went with your parents to Kenya, East Africa, and was raised in Nairobi. That must have been a bit of a culture shock for your parents. At birth to Kenya, may I ask why they decided to go to Kenya? I got to tell you, my my dad was born in Kenya. All right. And my mother um, met him out there, uh, and they got married out there. But basically, um, he was a young man, and he. During the early years of his youth, his grand, his parents sent him back to uh, Ed, to um, Lancashire, where he studied in St Helens um, at school right. with his with his older brother. And now there were other relatives, brothers, but um, those two stayed in in Lancashire. And as he grew up, then World War Two came, and he stayed in in the UK. And um, after that, he moved, you know, from there. But um, basically. He he was a Kenya Kenya guy, and um, it was just a dream to go back. And he he became a brewer like his father, and mm-hmm. um, and that was how it kind of, kind of came to being. So from a shop point of view, he knew what to expect, and my mother did. Um, they already knew the life, and, yeah. Um, so it was it was a little easier probably in that respect for them to do that transition. The book is based upon many experiences from your past and your family's rich heritage in Kenya. Can you paint a picture of your childhood there? I had the most dreamlike childhood you could ever imagine. <laughs> oh, don't make me uh, jealous. <laughs> hmm? I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I was raised basically as a, a bush kid as such. And I, I used to obviously go to school in Kenya, but... Um, but my life was was um, so free and easy in in many respects because um, I was allowed a lot of uh, freedom and and let and latitude because my mother mother and father both worked and um, and so I would stay at, and looked after by the African house uh, help by his wife and uh, mm. she would she would supervise me and um, and so. Uh, <laughs> She was a lot more slack than my mother was, so I was allowed a lot of freedom. Yeah, and and um, and to be honest with you, I could not repeat my my childhood ever again. It was just a unique situation. Um, I bet. You know, I I grew up with a second nature and dealing with creatures and animals and stuff like that because I was raised like that. But I remember as a kid, you know, I didn't wear shoes. I wore a pair of shorts and a, a sheath knife on my on my. Uh, <laughs> on my waist and no shirt and I would go out and uh, spend time in the bush talking to Africans out in the bush that I'd come across and come back at lunchtime or dinner time and that was my life and um, I would never trade it for the world. It almost sounds like um, Gerald Durrell type of life when he lived in Corfu. 
you know i loved his books and and to be honest with you we we shared a a, 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 certainly a similar lifestyle in a different way yeah your family eventually moved back to the uk and you completed your education at elizabeth college in guernsey the channel islands that must have been a bit of a contrast for you for you this time oh good lord um (laughs) <laughs> you know, you know, when I when I went back to England, um, I was a very young fella, and um, and Elizabeth College was where my cousin Jeffrey, who I dedicated one of the books to, um, Jeffrey and I were were raised in Kenya, right, uh, and um, and Jeff went to uh, Elizabeth College, and I asked my parents if I could go there, and they said yes, of course you can if you. If you work hard, you can study and we'll let you go. So I, I was allowed to go and it was a boarding school. And Elizabeth College is probably the most prominent building on the island of Guernsey. When you come into St. Peterport and you look up, there's a place that looks like it's a castle and it's right on the top of the of the hill there. And that's Elizabeth College. Right. Um, quick one. It was dedicated by Queen Elizabeth I in 1560. Wow. As an enormous heritage. Mm. And... Now, the Germans, when they were going to uh, plan their invasion of Britain, took over the school and used it as their headquarters. Yeah. And that, that was where World, World War II, um, the German head, headquarters, was to, to, to pre-plan the invasion. Yeah. Well, thank God we uh, saved that. But um, my point was that it's a school with huge history and, um, and, a, and a great story, in fact, uh, the story of Elizabeth College in itself is a is a book to read. After meeting your wife and starting a family, you became a very successful estate agent at one time owning an agency with your brother in the west of Cornwall, England. 1978, you moved to the USA, California in particular, and became a realtor. You certainly lived in some interesting places, but where were you inspired to start writing and what was the inspiration? <laughs> I know I've done a lot of things, but... Um... Mm-hmm. I've been a real estate man my whole life. Uh, I'm a salesman by trade, and um, I sold houses in England with my brother. We did very well for a period of time, but, um, you know, the amount of money we used to make to sell a house was so minimal. I used to make probably the equivalent of under £100 to sell a house in those days, and the average house price was under 10000 Yeah, So it was a, it was a hard-earned dollar. Uh, yeah. pound. And pound. Um, <laughs> one day somebody sent us a, uh, a, a a newspaper from California, the Sunday Times, and it said a woman had a woman real estate lady had, had joined the million dollar club. And I misinterpreted as that she'd made a million dollars in less than six months. So, so I said to my wife, good Lord, they're making lots of money there. <laughs> so uh, so we, we had a discussion and. Um, that's a whole story in itself, but we had a discussion and the next morning we said, okay, if we still want to do this, we'll go. And we decided there and then to go and try and emigrate. And we did. And it's been a wonderful life. Um, California has been good for us. Um, and probably, um, is my, my place of, of, uh, for the rest of my days. Back to African Sunsets, a settler's story. I see you're already receiving some great feedback, Roy, including, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I've never been to Africa. Well, I haven't either. And the author painted a beautiful description of the region, the animals and those sunsets that I would die for. He created characters that I developed a friendship with. It's an engaging story, and I can't wait to read the sequel. Well, I'm hoping there'll be a sequel. Well, it's definitely worth a read, and I am an avid reader. Praise indeed, Roy. So will there be a sequel? Absolutely. I'm in the middle of it. Oh, I've, been, I've been in the middle of it for a while because I, <laughs> I get so damn busy. I don't get a chance to sometimes stop. But but the truth is I'm in the middle of it and I've got a great sequel coming up. Lots of action, um, even more action than the first book in a different way. But um, <laughs> part of life there. And uh, I wanted to expand on that. And oh. um, the reason it's taken me a while is because I wanted to make sure that I got all my facts right. And the way I wrote the book, uh, I wanted everybody to get a a certain element of uh, the excitement that started in the first one. So, yeah, I I, I'd love to write and I'd love to do a lot more writing and probably will do as I go along.
Lastly, where can Book Talk Radio Club's listeners purchase African Sunset, a settler's story? I'm sorry, I, I forgive me. It's okay, don't worry. I said, lastly, where can Book Talk Radio Club's listeners oh. purchase African Sunset, a settler's story? On Amazon.com. Oh, that's easy, isn't it? It's easy, <laughs> yeah. I kept it simple for the time being. And um, it'll remain there because I think it's the most uh, uh, straightforward place to buy it. And uh, and that works. Good. All right. Well, that's lovely. Thank you, Roy. Um, that was great. Good luck for the future. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Book Talk Radio. Have a to speak to you again. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invite. Bye-bye. Bye.